This is the deal, uh, the portion of the chapter dealing with significant figures, also known as sig figs, or as I like to call them, siggy figgies, or I will abbreviate SF on uh, slides as we go. And this is where we're going to talk about what significant figures are, etc. Okay, well, when we report measurements, measurements are written to indicate the uncertainty in the measurement. So if I tell you to um, how many jelly beans are in the jar and I just want approximation, you may say, you know, 2,500. But when they're playing games with the jelly beans, they want to know down to the nearest jelly bean. So you have to indicate the uncertainty in the measurement itself. Some things, if it doesn't matter, you need approximately a foot of length to of hose to do whatever, that's fine. You cut off about a foot. But if you're doing dealing with something that requires it down to an eighth of an inch, quarter of an inch, a millimeter, etc., you've got to get it as exact. So the the way to know how exact you need it is called significant figures. And when you're writing these measurements, all the dish, digits are written with known certainty except for the last digit. So the last digit is always an estimate. So the last one you absolutely know is the one right before the last one. So how do you write this? Well, one way to do it is using scientific notation. Now, your calculator will do scientific notation. It usually doesn't do it unless you make it do it on all the numbers, but it will do it for large and small numbers automatically. And the reason why this is important is, is scientific notation consists of two parts. You have your first number, which always has one digit and then the decimal. You never have, um, if, I, if I were to say 2.1, um, three, that's wrong because you can only have one digit before the des decimal. Otherwise, it is not proper scientific notation. Okay, and then you have this part. Now, this is where it shows the significance. The number of di digits listed here. This just is a placer. Okay, so for example, if you write this number here, this is two significant digits. We'll about that in just a minute. So you could write it as that, or you could write it this way. Okay, on this one, if you'll notice, you're moving the decimal to the right, it's a negative. If you're moving it to the left, it's a positive. So basically, if you're taking a small number and making it smaller, then you have a positive exponent. If you take a small number and make it bigger, you have a negative exponent. So your exponent basically tells you how many places to move to the left or to the right. So that brings us to the rules of writing significant figures. So I'm going to give you the rules. We're going to walk through them and look at them as we go. All non-zero digits are significant. So if I write one, two, three, four, five, then these are all significant. Okay, zeros between non-zero digits are significant. So if I had one, oh, two, three, four, then they're all significant because we call that zero a trapped zero. Zeros to the left of the first non-zero digit are not significant. They merely indicate the position of the decimal point. Huh? Okay. <laughs> Let's say you have 112. You do not write a zero in front of it unless you need it for some bizarre reason. Now, if it's a small number and you had 0 .00112, those zeros are not significant. 
significant because there's no other way to write them unless you convert it to scientific notation. Time 10 to the minus 3. That shows that only three, three figures are significant. The other ones are pleasures. Now, zeros that fall both at the end of a number and to the right of the decimal point are significant. So if you were to say you had 12.0 millimeters, okay, then this number is significant because otherwise you just say 12. But if you're trying to be exact, you would say 12.0. There's no reason to write that zero unless it's important. And if it's important, it's significant. So if it precedes, if it follows the decimal before numbers, then it's just a placeholder. But if it follows the decimal after numbers and there's no non-zero number between it. now. If you had 0.01, then all four are significant because you've got it trapped. Okay? So zeros are the tricky one. So when a number ends in zeros but contains no decimal point, the zeros may or may not be significant. You must assume that um, they are not significant unless you use one of the two. So, for example... If we start off with this number right here, so we got 12,000. Are those zeros significant? Because it's possible, we're counting jelly beans again, that we have exactly 12,000 jelly beans. We may have 12,005, in which case this is an approximation. We don't know. So with nothing else put there to indicate, then we only have two significant figures, two significant figures. So these two are significant. Now, we can use scientific notation, for example, if we did scientific notation and put 1.2 times 10 to the 3, then we have two significant figures. If we did 1.20, that's three significant figures. 1.200 times 10 to the 3rd, three, four significant figures. So in each of these cases, we haven't changed the number. And that's the other trick is you cannot change the value of the number. You can just represent it differently. And this shows you how many digits are significant because remember the first part of the number is the significant part. Or this is part A. So for part B, you can underline or put it over. And I'll be honest, I've seen more over than under. So if we say we have 12, 0, 0, we're going to keep the same thing. And I put a line right here, either over or under, either one, then that means that I have four significant figures. Because the 1, 2, 0, 0 count, that 0 is a placer. Okay, if I put it here, then it's only three significant figures. See how it works? Now, some people really, really like significant notation. Some people don't. I tend to use significant fig uh, scientific notation, but I've occasionally been known to do the other. It doesn't matter whichever one floats your boat, but the trick is identifying the number of significant figures. That is critical. And this is the part that a number of people have uh, usually have a little bit of a problem with. So we're going to try to walk through the examples um, that we're going to do in a minute um, in detail. But before we do that, if you'll notice I wrote over it that exact conversions have infinitely many significant figures. That's the infinitely many. Infinitely many. Okay, that, okay, technically it's the infinity symbol, but in math if you have that then that means you go on to you know to infinity and beyond so that means we have infinitely many significant figures and what is an exact number well exact numbers are actually common sense for example baseballs can you have half a baseball is it work can you play with half a baseball no so baseballs have to have whole numbers 
Okay. A dozen by definition is 12 items. A baker's dozen is 13, but a dozen is not 11 cookies or 11.5 cookies or 12.3 cookies. It is by definition a dozen. Therefore, that makes it exact. One foot is exactly 12 inches, not 13 inches, etc. All metric conversions, all of them, those are significant. Okay, um, 2.54 centimeters is exactly one inch. And with conversions, if is an exact conversion other than metrics, which you're just told they're all, um, it'll say exact or exactly. And that means it's exact. Otherwise, it won't. Uh, a cup is eight ounces. It's not 7.79. A pound is 16 ounces, etc. Uh, there's a conversion that says um, there are 2.2 pounds per one kilogram. That is not exact. Okay, so that would have two significant figures. Okay, you can't count the one, you have to count the other one. So that would be two significant figures. So that is not exact. These other ones are exact. All right, and when you're dealing with significant figures, and this is one of my personal pet peeves, is you've got to add zeros without changing the number. So if the calculator says four, and it's not going to give you significant figures, don't even try it. Um, some of them say they will, but I've seen some that try, and it really depends on how you put the number in. So it may not have all the data. So I would not rely on my calculator for significant figures. So if you need three significant figures and your calculator says four, then you put a decimal with two zeros behind it. That gives you three significant figures. 1.5 gives you 0 0.1.50, 0 0.2, 0 0.200, and 12 is 12.0. Okay, notice, use a zero as a placer. And the reason why is is when you're going to be typing things in, it's easier to see. But if you're handwriting, um, if you write this, is that a decimal or is that a squiggle? Okay, see, that is that a stray mark or is that? So if you write, even with a stray mark, then I know that that means a decimal because there's no reason to write the zero out front unless you're trying to mark it as a decimal. Okay. And um, that is not a significant figure as you go. Okay, so let's try to list the number of significant figures in each of the following. Now, my recommendation is, is that when you're listening to this video, go ahead and stop it and write down what you think for each of them right now. And then oh, I'm about to work it and then you can check it once I've worked it so that you get an idea of whether you understand it before I go through it. So if we look at it, in A we have four digits, none of them zeros, so we have four significant figures. So on B, this is written in scientific notation, so we don't care whether it's 10 to the 4, 14, 440, whatever, we don't care about that part. We only care here and we have three digits, so we have three significant figures. Now, one of them happens to be a zero, but you don't write it in the front of scientific notation unless it's important. Now, for C, um, these two are what we call placers. They keep the position, but they're not important. So only these are important. So on this one, we have three significant figures. On D, this one we know is significant. This one is significant, and then we have these two zeros which are questionable when in doubt don't so with no other information given then we would say we have two significant figures now if over here if i had written it like that then that's four significant figures if i had written it as that then that would be three significant figures but because i didn't enlist that anywhere on the first one it's only two all right so, oh wait, here we go. So we know that this one counts, this one counts, this one counts, so that one counts because it's trapped. 
Oh wait, we got the little underline, so that one counts and that one counts. So one, two, three, four, five, six. So we have six significant figures. The only one that doesn't count is that one here. Now, can you drop it? No, you can't drop it because then you will have changed the number value. So easiest way to think about this is would you rather me give you $12 or $120? Makes a difference, that little zero there. Okay, so on this one, this is significant. We know all those are significant. We know that zeros behind a decimal behind a number uh, are count because there's no reason to write this unless it's important. This one's strictly a placer. So here we have four significant figures in this problem. Okay, makes sense. There are a number of other problems in your text. So um, you need to go through and work them out. Now, here's where the fun begins. Um, first off, you have to ID the number of significant figures. Then, if you use them in calculations, there are rules associated with that. There are two different rules. First rule involves multiplication and division. And the second rule involves addition and subtraction. Okay? So, in multiplication and division, the result must be reported in no more significant figures than the measurement with the fewest significant figures. So, what you do is do the math and then use least number of significant figures. Multiplication division, uh, and division is relatively easy, okay? Addition and subtraction is a little bit trickier because you have placeholders, okay? So, for example, um, let's play kindergarten, <laughs> okay? So, if you have 12, 1.23, 4.007, and um, 12.1, and you're going to add them all together. And notice I put them in place. So assuming I can follow it is 733.2492. Um, I think that's right. 29.337. Okay. So if we look at this, how many significant figures do we report this in? Well, we actually would report this as a number as 29. You're like, wait, you got more than that, but look at the decimal places. So you report it in the same number as the least number of decimal places. So if you look at it and think of it as change, um, when you, if you do your taxes, then you know the IRS doesn't care about um, change. It can be 12.48, and they don't care about the 48. You keep up with it because 48 plus another 12 cents gets you to round up. And if you're looking for deductions, that's what you want to do. Okay, so what we look at is this one only has one place after the decimal. This has three places. Um, this has two places, and this one has zero places. So you have to report it as zero places after the decimal. Okay, so the ju just remember the trick is, is with addition and subtraction, you look at decimal places. With multiplication and division, you strictly look at numbers. Now, the last rule is rounding. Do not round at each step. Do not round at all until you come to the very end. And you're rounding using the 5 rule. So if you have 4.5, that goes to 5. If you have 4.4, .4, that rounds to 4. And the reason I point this out is everybody goes like, that's how you round, right? Actually, there are multiple ways to round. There's a whole thing that if you have odd numbers, uh, you round up. If you have any even numbers, you round down. We're not doing that. I'm just making sure everybody understands that we're using rounding. So, for example, on this one, we had less than 5, so we left it as 29. Okay, small but significant point. So, let's look at um, some problems here. So, we're going to do multiplication division, show you 
an example of each, and then we're going to work a couple problems of each, okay? So if uh, you look at it, you multiply these numbers together, you're going to get this value right here. And if we look back at it, this number is two significant figures. This one's four, four, and three. So you're going to report in the least number, so you would report it as two. So 1852 is going to round to 1900, so you only have two significant figures. Okay, now, should you report both values? Um, I, I recommend report both, and I'll tell you why. Because of partial credit. So, for example, if you had uh, the 1852 and you reported as 1800, then that tells me that you can do significant figures, but you can't round. So, if for some reason you get a bad math number, so instead of getting that, you got um, 745, then that tells me that you this is a bad number, but then if you reported it as 750 using significant figures, this tells me you can do significant figures, but you can't do bad math. So this is bad math. So the reason why I recommend you report both values is so that I can see what you get. That's how partial credit works. If you don't report either one and you get your final number is 1800, then I'm going to mark it wrong a lot more because I don't know if you can't round or if you actually got a bad number. For addition and subtraction, we use the exact same numbers. No difference on the numbers. We got a totally different answer because we added them. And here we're, we're looking instead of significant figures. This one happens to be two significant figures, but it's two places after the decimal. This one's four significant figures, but it's three places after the, the decimal, four and one, etc. So when we're done, we were only reported in one decimal place because it's addition and subtraction. Okay. So, at this point in time, if you can, pause the video and go ahead and do the math. And then I'm about to run through the numbers so you can see if you can do the math. Now, I'm going to tell you right now that your calculator is your best friend and your worst nightmare. So, if you don't start practicing using it and making sure that you can put in the scientific notation, etc., and um, I'm going to do a tutorial a separate tutorial on calculators, etc., then um, you have a major problem. Okay, so as we work this one, when we solve for it, we're going to get 0.713 is our answer. Now we're adding and subtracting. So this is three decimal places. This is three, and this is one. So we report in how many? The smallest number. So we would report this as 0.7. Okay. The second one, we're going to end up with 11.11614. Again, we're looking at decimal places. So we have 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So we report in 3. So it's 11.116, okay? So then the rules change for this because this is multiplication and division. So here, when we work this one, we get 2.4698850. Well, this is four significant figures. This is three significant figures. And this is three significant figures. So we're going to report in three significant figures, which is the least. So it's 2.47. Again, the 6 has a 9 following it, so we report up. This last one, we're going to get 0 0.02068230. Now, if you'll notice, I didn't worry about significant figures when I did my math originally. Um, so now I'm going to go back and look. This is one, two, three, four, five significant figures. All of these zeros are significant. 
because they're trapped between the one and a decimal or they're following the decimal and there's no reason to follow unless it's important. This one's three significant figures and this is only two significant figures because these are placer zeros. So you're going to report in two significant figures. So we get 0 0.021 as my value here. Okay, so here we've done significant figures and calculations. There are a whole lot more in your text. There are more on mastering. So make sure you look over these because significant figures are going to come into play when we do all of our problems. They're an automatic part of your grade. So do it accordingly. In the past, a number of people have lost five to six points a test because they don't think that significant figures are going to be there. They're going to be there on every single test forward. Okay. So now let's look at some examples that you'll probably run into. Remember back when we were doing temperature, um, Kelvin is 273.15 plus whatever degree C are. So this is two places and this is going to be addition and subtraction. So we're looking at two places after the decimal is your maximum. But whatever the degree C is, is going to set it up unless it's more than two places after the decimal. Okay. This conversion for Celsius to Fahrenheit or Fahrenheit to Celsius, pick one, is exact. So if you started with four digits, then you end up with four digits. If you started with two, you end up with two. Any conversions associated with metric are going to be whatever you started with. So if you started with four, you end up with four. If you started with eight, you end up with eight. Same thing down here. Um, these are both examples of metric conversions. Okay? And they have infinitely many significant figures. All right, that brings us to two things that are important, especially in lab. Uh, I know you're not in lab physically this summer, but we'll talk about precision and accuracy as we look at measurements. Okay, precision is the closeness of a measurement to each other. If you are reproducing each other, um, an experiment, if you're doing it over and over again, you want your values to come out similarly to get good precision. So the measurements have to be close to each other. Now accuracy is the closeness of the measurement to the actual value. And believe it or not, these are ideally um, is what you want to strive for. You want precision and accuracy. <laughs> but we don't always get what we, what we aim for. So in some cases in lab, your instructor might be looking for precision. In other cases, they're looking for accuracy. So you might want to pay attention to what is asked for because there are particular labs where I want you to be precise. I don't care if you're even in the ballpark accuracy wise. And then there are other ones where you can do multiple runs and I just need you to be accurate once because your precision is going to be all over the place. And as we work through things, you're going to see values given to you um, of what values might be expected in lab and you need to calculate them from there. So again, if you'll notice there's a dart board. So if we want to look at it, Overall, um, you can look at it. This um, dart door is precise, but not accurate. This one is accurate, but not precise. Because he's in the center, or she's in the center. Don't be sexist. Um, but it's all over the place. This is both accurate and precise. So if you're going to play darts, this is the person you want to play with, not against, because you're going to 
be in trouble unless you're the one of these people. So anyway, when you look at look at values in lab, you may be asked to look at the values as and assess them as to their precision or their accuracy. Okay, because there are certain things in lab that you just can't achieve. And then there are other things where it's mandatory. This is like life. Sometimes you just dump and go when you're cooking. And other times you have to exactly measure out. If you're making jelly, dump and go does not work at all. So there you have to be accurate and precise. So this brings us to almost the last segment of chapter one. We have one more segment to go, but do go back through the problems that we've already worked and now go back and look at them with respect to the significant figures and go oh yeah that's how she got that and in the next one we will work with those directly